The Lord's Prayer, Hallowed Be Thy Name, continued. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Matthew 6, verse 9. A name, in our modern usage, is a mere sign, badge, or title by which we call a person, a means of identification. It has no significance except to distinguish that person from everyone else. It does not tell us anything about a man, except that he exists as a person and is himself, not someone else. His character, his exploits, his attainments in life, his history, are not contained in his name. It is a mere mark of identity and no more. But it was quite different in Bible days, and more especially among the Semitic peoples. In the Old Testament, there is abundant evidence that names were looked upon as very sacred and pregnant words. There is not much meaning in our modern names. Edgar means a javelin to protect property. Though few Edgars own a javelin, and many of them no real estate. Irene means peace, but I have personally known Irenes who had a little inner peace. They were often upset, frustrated, and miserable. As for our surnames, they have been so changed by the years that they are now only a tag by which the mail carrier marks us off from our neighbors. The name E.B. is, we have reason to believe, an ancient Celtic name, but previously was spelled E-B-I or E-B-E-E, -E, and is now sometimes spelled E-B-E -E or E-A-B-Y. And who today knows what it could mean? Most of our names originally came from one of four sources. A name may have come from a characteristic that an individual had. He could run very good, so he got the name Swift. He was sloppy, so he got the name Hogue. He was shrewd, so he got the name Fox. Sometimes men got named by virtue of where they lived. There was a fellow by the name of John, and when somebody was asking for him and another person knew him, he said, Oh yes, that's John. He lives over the brook. So he got the name Overbrook. Or there was a guy named George. Oh yes, we know him. He lives at the water. So he became known in the course of time as George Atwater. Sometimes we got named by virtue of our father's name. You see, men did not always have second names. That's relatively recent in history. There was a man by the name of John, and he had a son. People said, oh yes, that's John's son, or that's Anders' son, or that's Robin's son. So we got names like Johnson, Anderson, and Robinson. At other times, we got names by virtue of the trade in which men worked. Cook, Taylor, Smith, etc. Biblically, names had the concept of describing some characteristic of an individual which set that individual apart from other individuals. The idea of a name was to express as dramatically as possible the nature or characteristic of the bearer. In this connection, there can be no separation whatsoever between a man's name and what he is as a person. Some are said to have a name of integrity, while others are declared to have a bad name. In such instances, name and character are one and the same. In the Bible, the innermost being of a man is expressed in his name. Take Jacob, for instance. He starts life by holding on to his brother's heel to keep him from emerging first from the mother's womb. Then comes his opportunistic acquisition of his brother's birthright in exchange for a bowl of lentils. And then the climax deceiving his blind father Isaac to receive his blessing by posing as the firstborn Esau. Spurred on by his mother, who plots the deception, Jacob is an all-too-willing participant. He dresses up in goatskin, so he will feel and smell like his brother, the hunter. And when asked who he is, he lies and says, I am Esau, your firstborn. Even though the old man appears to have some doubt, the ploy works, and Jacob receives the blessing. This is why Esau declares of his conniving brother, Is he not rightly named Jacob, supplanter, schemer, deceiver, trickster? For he has supplanted me these two times. Genesis 27, verse 36. But in later years, after wrestling with the angel of the Lord, he underwent a change of attitude and an alteration of character that was accompanied by a change of name. Having seen the face or nature of God, 
he was no longer the same man that he had been before his encounter with the Lord. Since name and character are absolutely identical, there had to be a change in Jacob's appellation. The angel of Yahweh therefore said, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Genesis 32, verse 28. There is a feeling that one's name actually possesses a certain power over its bearer, because it cannot be separated from the essence of his personality. In the name Nabal, the husband of Abigail, is found the expression of his essential character. Seeking to excuse him, she says, as his name is, so is he. Nabal, which means fool, is his name, and folly is with him. Second Samuel 22, verse 25. To him that overcometh will I give a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Revelation 2, verse 17. He that overcometh, I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 3, verse 12. And they shall see his face, nature, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation 22, verse 4. A new name bespeaks of a change of nature in those he is dealing with. But God has also revealed the various sides of his own nature and character through his names. At the beginning of history, God revealed himself by the name Elohim, the plural of Eloah, meaning strength, might. This name reveals the plurality in God, his many-sided wisdom, his diverse attributes, powers, and abilities displayed like the colors of the spectrum through the unique expression of each of his multitudinous offspring, his sons and daughters, the body of Christ, the family of God, or the God family. In the name Elohim, God has revealed himself first as creator and second as plural God. Then when Abraham came along, God revealed himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty, the All-Sufficient. El Shaddai means literally the breasted one, or the one who has breasts. We never thought of God as having breasts, but he revealed himself to Abraham in this way as the nourisher, the one from whom he could suck and draw strength. This enabled Abraham and Sarah to have Isaac when they were past age for having children. Abraham was a hundred years old, and Sarah was ninety when they had their baby. God later revealed himself to Moses, not as Elohim, not as El Shaddai, but he made himself known to Moses as Yahweh, which generally is pronounced in English as Jehovah. Yahweh was the lawgiver. Yahweh was a stern God, the one who commands and says, Do it or you die. Yahweh was a warring God, the Lord of hosts, armies. Then, of course, when Jesus came, we have a combination of all of these, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Finally, after Jesus comes all of us. The question follows, who are we going to reveal? Section. The name is the nature. The name of God is more than a group of syllables or a configuration of letters of the alphabet. It is the meaning of the name that is most truly the name. It is his nature and his character revealed to us. The names of God reveal all that God is, all that God has, and all that God can do. So when we pray, Hallowed be thy name, we ask that our idea, our understanding of God's nature, power, and glory may be purified and made more true, that we may be delivered from unworthy conceptions and false notions of God, from superstitious beliefs and folklore learned from religion, that there may be nothing in our thought of Him and the living out of His life in us which shall cast any reflection on Him that is beneath His glorious and eternal reality that he may become more and more known to us and his nature loved by us and fulfilled within us. George Wiley wrote some years ago, quote, In his high priestly prayer recorded in John 17, twice the Son of God said he had manifested and declared the Father's name unto those the Father had given him. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. 
Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. John 17, verse 26. Also in the last verse of this prayer he said, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. If we examine these two verses closely, we will see something that may have escaped our notice previously. First of all, the Lord said, I have manifested thy name unto the men thou gavest me, and they have kept thy word. Part of the word he gave them was the Father's name, and this was the word they kept. Now notice the importance of the Father's name. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. It is through the name of the Father that we are kept. There is power in the name of God to keep us from evil and the evil one. And it was through the power of this name that the Son asked his Father to protect and keep those the Father had given him. Then he said, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. Now notice the result of his declaring unto them the Father's name. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. It would seem from these words that the fullness of the love of God being in us, and the Son himself dwelling in us, is commensurate with the fullness of our knowledge of the Father's name. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. How much do we really know God's name? I would like to quote these verses from some other translations. Most translations, as well as the Aramaic and Greek, in which these scriptures were originally written, say name, but Goodspeed renders it this way. I have revealed your real self unto the men you gave me from the world. I have made yourself known to them and will still do so. Phillips says something similar. I have shown yourself to the men whom you gave me out of the world. I have made yourself known to them, and I will continue to do so, that the love which you had for me may be in their hearts. It would appear from these scriptures that there is some connection between knowing the name of God and knowing God himself, and having his love in our hearts. I don't think it was because the disciples were ignorant of what God's name was, that is, the form of his name in letters. How could they be? for it was written in the Old Testament scriptures thousands of times. So how could they not have known what the name of God was? There must be a difference in knowing what the name of God is and knowing his name. This may sound strange, but I will try to explain. There are many things said about those who know the name of God. For instance, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Psalms 91, verse 14. Would this promise apply to all who merely knew what his name was? The children of Israel all knew what God's name was, but because of their sins and iniquities they were cast down, chastised by the Lord, and given over into the hands of their enemies to be tormented. But then God spoke comfort to them, and told them the days of their chastisement were over. By their sinful ways they had caused his name to be blasphemed among the pagans. But now God was going to exalt his name, and his people would know what his name really meant when he had delivered them from their bondage. Yes, Yahweh says this, You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without money. Yes, Yahweh says this, Once my people went down to Egypt to settle there, then the Assyrians bitterly oppressed them. But now, what is there for me here? It is Yahweh who speaks. All day long my name is constantly blasphemed. My people will therefore know my name. That day they will understand that it is I who say, I am here. Isaiah 52, verses 3 through 6, the Jerusalem Bible. And that day when God had delivered them from the bondage of their enemies, having redeemed them by his great power, they would know his name. They would know what his name meant, and know him experientially in the meaning of his name. They would know the power that was in the name of Yahweh. They knew what his name was, but they did not know experientially the reality of it. This is what we need to know. 
The disciples knew what God's name was. The scriptures were full of it. But it took the Son to manifest and declare to them the name of the Father, that they might know his name. And knowing it, they would come to the knowledge of God himself. I will now quote a few more verses where God emphasized his name. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Yah, and rejoice before him. Psalms 68, verse 4. Yah is the short form of Yahweh. The Hebrews did the same thing we do. We shorten some names, such as Joe for Joseph, Sue for Susan, Bev for Beverly, and so on. They often used just El for Elohim, Adon for Adonai, and Yah for Yahweh. I am Yahweh, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42, 8. Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahweh. Jeremiah 16, verse 21. To know his name is to know his might, his power, and majesty. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Yahweh, and his name one. Zechariah 14, verse 9. The Son of God came and manifested and declared his Father's name unto his own, in fulfillment of the prophecy given in Psalms 22, verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. God wants his people to know his name and to know him. This is why Jesus came and manifested his Father's name. To know his name is to know him, and to know him, the only true God, is life eternal. It is blessed to know his name. There are great benefits promised to those who know and love his name. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18 verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Yahweh, has not forgotten them that seek thee. Psalms 9, verse 10. End quote. When it is said, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God, the meaning is not that they will recall the letters or pronunciation of the word Yahweh, but that their confidence can be strengthened and maintained by reflecting upon what God has taught and proven concerning himself which is also contained in the meaning of his name. When it is said, They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, it does not mean that those who know the word Yahweh will put their trust in him, for multitudes have known that name and have never walked in confidence in God. But whoever has that idea of God, that he himself by his dealings and teachings has made known to us in our lives, will trust in him. This name we are not left to find out for ourselves, for from the first it has been the care of God to spell out himself to us. There are many names and descriptive titles of God in the scriptures. He is called Counselor, King, Shepherd, Rock, Shield, High Tower, Strong Arm, and many, many others. Someone has said that there are about 200 names for God in the Bible. The moment one begins to splinter the absolute wholeness that God is, to examine all his multifaceted aspects and attributes, the number of splinters are as infinite as God is infinite. Each name of God, as he progressively revealed himself, was a fresh and fuller revelation of the nature of God. One was a revelation of his might. Another was the unveiling of his grace. One revealed something more of his wisdom another of his holiness, another of his tenderness, and yet another of his judgment. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 30, we read, Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass, after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. They were not esteeming the letters in his name, nor the pronunciation of the name. They were not writing, D-A-V-I-D, in large and beautiful characters on some enormous banner and stretching it over the main street of Jerusalem. The fact that his name was esteemed meant he himself and his triumphs were esteemed. We say today, so-and-so has made a name for himself. So-and-so has a good name. 
we mean that there is something good and honorable about his character, worthy of our praise. David is said to have behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by, meaning precious. God told him, I have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. 2 Samuel 7 verse 9. When an Old Testament writer wished to forcibly express the determining qualities of a man, he said, He shall be called so-and-so, as when Jerusalem, after it had been purged from unrighteousness, shall be called the City of Righteousness. Isaiah 1 verse 26. And the Messiah shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6 meaning that he actually will be these things. Thus, the name of God means the character, qualities, attributes of God, that which makes him what he is in himself and in his manifestation to man. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Psalms 91 verse 14. To know his name is to become, in union with him, the name nature of God in every hour, everyday reality. To know his name is to enter into the pure inner life of God and exude his nature, his life, his character, being one with him. To know means more than mere intellectual understanding or carnal knowledge. It means intimate union as when Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain. Genesis 4 verse 1. Some people think because they use or pronounce El Elyon, Yahweh, or Yahshua, and all the others they have dug out of the concordance, that this makes the use of these names magical, procures favor with God, or is a mark of spirituality. People without a revelation from the Lord, or participation in His life, are disposed to go back and use the letter of that given to past generations of men of God. Let me quote Psalms 9 verse 10 again. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. The message is clear. They that have experienced the inworking, the development, and formation of thy nature will confidently trust in thee. If this has not been your experience yet, that is, the inworking and formation of his nature within, then you do not yet know the name of the Lord, though you may be zealous to consistently use the word Yahshua, Yahweh, and all the other forms in the Hebrew Bible. After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the nations upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord. Acts 15, verses 16 through 17. The name here means a surname. That is the precise meaning of the Greek word epikaleomei used in this passage, spelled E-P-I-K-A-L-E-O-M-A-I. Correctly translated, it says that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the nations upon whom my surname is called. The nations have been surnamed. Surname is from two Greek words, epi, E-P-I, and keleo, K-A-L-E-O. Epi means upon, and keleo means called. Epi means identification, as in the laying on of hands on or upon a person designating them for some special purpose or blessing. God has chosen to identify with us and bring us into relationship with himself as he has placed his name upon us, has surnamed us. Surname is, by definition, a family name, as distinguished from a given name, a last name. God came and surnamed us, gave us his family name. We have an altered name, indeed a new name. God altered Abram's name, Sarai's name, and Jacob's name, and they got a new nature. It was only after Abram's and Sarai's name changed that they gave birth to Isaac, the promised seed. And it was only after Jacob's name changed that he fathered Joseph and Benjamin. You won't birth nobility or kings or a son of the right hand until you get altered, surnamed. I meet a lot of folks I would like to alter. You may have a husband, a wife, children, boss, neighbor, or mother-in-law that you would like to alter. 
and you are probably an expert on all the ways they need to be altered. But I do not hesitate to tell you, precious friend of mine, that only God can alter anyone. Only God can call his name over a man, woman, or child. Only God can give a surname, a new name, a new nature. The scripture declares that the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. There are many precious revelations coming forth these days concerning the names of God and the depth of meaning therein. Some immediately get caught up with an emphasis on the mechanics, the spelling, syllables, and pronunciation of the names, dealing with the outward or letter of the word. But it is the letter that killeth. That is, there is no life in those things. They strike no chord deep in my spirit. In fact, they leave me somewhat cold and uninspired. The spirit of the word gives life. The spirit is the substance, the reality of his nature that the outward name reveals. As Ray Prinzing has so aptly written, quote, Of this we are certain, there is a walk that is not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. When certain truths are set down as a doctrine, and one receives only the letter thereof, it does not serve to gender life within. It only becomes one more burden to bear, adding to the load of traditions and commandments. But when the Spirit of God illumines the inner man, quickens the heart to receive the word of life within, it is not some doctrine to contend for, but it is a life to be lived. Unquote. Now listen. We have people today who will not call God anything but Yahweh. There are other people who only call God Jehovah. We have people today who refuse to call the Son of God Jesus. They call him Yahshua. And that is his name in Hebrew. But that is not what is important. It is not important what the Hebrew form of a name is, or what the Greek form of a name is, or what the English form of a name is. Whether we say Petros, Pedro, Pierre or Peter, all these names are the same name in different languages, have the same meaning, and point to the same reality. A man whose character is that of a rock. It is important to learn what names mean. What is important is that we partake of the nature that the name is conveying. And so we need to know the name of God. We need to know the name of God because it reveals to us a side of God's nature. You see, there are different sides to all of us. I have one side as a minister of the gospel. I have another side as a husband. I have another side as a father. I have another side as a grandfather. I have another side as a citizen of the United States of America. I have yet another side as a son of God. We have different sides to our reality. My wife calls me by my name as a husband. She calls me honey. My children call me by my name as a father. They call me Daddy. My grandchildren call me by my name as a grandparent. They call me Grandpa. Many of the Lord's people address me as a fellow member of the body of Christ. They call me Brother. So we need to know what the name, nature, of the Lord is. Because the name, nature, of the Lord is a strong tower. A strong tower is a defense. You can run into a strong tower and you are safe. You are defended by that name. If you know the nature of God and you become a partaker of that divine nature, there is a safety built into your makeup because you have run into or you have become identified with the name of God. A tower has height. A tower carries you heavenward. A tower is not a military bunker. If you run into a tower and climb the heights of that tower, you are lifted above all the dangers arrayed below. That's what the name of the Lord does for us. When we know that name, becoming partakers of that nature, it elevates us in our outlook, perspective, understanding, consciousness, and state of being. It raises us up experientially into a higher dimension. It lifts us to a higher level of faith, trust, and confidence because we stand in his name. Knowing the word Yahweh will not do this for you, but knowing the nature of Yahweh will. I'm not interested that you should learn the correct form and pronunciation, whether it be, as various scholars argue, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahvah, Yehovah, Jehovah, or quite a number of other forms that are hyped as the correct Hebrew form. The best known, Yahweh, is only one among many. 
There is no value in wrangling over letters of the alphabet or ancient vowel sounds. There's no purpose in it. There's no spirituality in it. There is no profit in it. Our language is not Hebrew. I doubt if more than one or two persons among the thousands who read these writings each month actually speak Hebrew. There is no change of nature for you should you learn it, and all the names of God in Hebrew. And yet we have men in movements that place great emphasis upon names today, spelling them correctly, pronouncing them right. To which I respond, who cares? That's not important. Furthermore, it is natural, carnal, fleshly. What is important is that you understand what the name stands for and partake of the nature that the name stands for. And they that know thy name, thy nature, will put their trust in thee. You don't learn this name, this nature, from listening to sermons or reading printed messages. Those things are profitable, for we must hear the truth. But we must not only hear, we must receive a revelation of truth and follow on to experience truth. For God will save Zion, that they may dwell there, and have it in possession. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Psalm 69, verses 35 through 36. Those that love his name shall inherit and dwell in Zion, saith the Lord. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that we are not only come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, but we are also come to Mount Zion. But what is Mount Zion? To correctly unlock this expression, we need to go back and consider the shadow. Israel was the whole nation, Jerusalem the capital city. And while the government was seated in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem comprised all the ruling class, yet in Jerusalem there was only one who with his household dwelt on Mount Zion. He was the king. The fortress of David the king was on Mount Zion. He was the highest pinnacle of glory attainable. But that Zion was only a shadow of the true Mount Zion unto which we are come. For the prophet declares, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Psalms 132 verses 13 through 14. And Paul tells us, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. David was king over natural Israel. Christ is king over spiritual Israel. David dwelt on the natural Mount Zion. Therefore, Christ dwells in the spiritual Zion. And this spiritual Zion is composed of those who have reached the very highest pinnacle attainable in the heavenly Jerusalem. Those who, like King Saul of old, are head and shoulders above all others. Those who have followed their Lord all the way to Calvary. These are those of whom it is written, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name, nature, written in their foreheads. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Revelation 14, verses 1 and 4. When you follow the Lamb, He leads you to Mount Calvary, the place of death. But from Calvary, He leads you to glory and exaltation upon Mount Zion. Spiritual Zion is the little remnant, the ones who have attained the highest pinnacle of attainment in the spiritual realm, the overcomers who sit with Christ upon His throne and rule and reign over all things in the kingdom of God. And you can only attain to this reality of Zion by loving the name of the Lord. Because he hath known my name, I will show him my salvation. Are you interested in knowing the name of God? When you truly come to the name of the Lord, God will show you his salvation. The word for salvation is Yehoshua, Y-E-H-O-S-H-U-A. My salvation is my Yehoshua. Translated into English, Yehoshua is Jesus. Because he hath known my name, I will show him my Jesus. When you know the nature of the Lord, you will see Jesus. Jesus is the salvation of the Lord. That is the meaning of his name. He came in the nature and power of God's salvation. He is the mighty deliverer. He is the mighty savior. That is his name. That is his nature. Whether you call him Jesus or Yahshua, 
Until you meet him as the mighty Savior, you have missed his name altogether. Millions of people repeat the name Jesus or Yahshua and yet know nothing of his wonderful name, his nature. They know the pronunciation of his name in a language, but they have never experienced him in his name. Section Yahweh The name Yahweh is derived from the Hebrew Hava, H-A-V-A-H, meaning to be or being. This word is almost exactly like the Hebrew verb Shava, C-H-A-V-A-H, which means to live or life. One can readily see the connection between being and life. Thus, Yahweh means the self-existent one, or the eternal. He is the one who in himself possesses essential life, permanent existence, derived from no source other than himself, and absolutely dependent upon no other person or thing for its continuance. Any being whose existence is dependent in any manner upon another, or upon conditions such as food, light, air, etc., or even upon some cosmic influence, is not self-existent. This quality inherited originally in Yahweh alone, as it is written, The Father hath life in himself. John 5, verse 26. That means that his existence is not a derived one, nor a sustained one, not derived from anything nor dependent upon anything, but inherent and eternal within himself. God did not get his life from any ancestor, nor did he have to eat a hamburger today to keep up his strength. The verbs to be and to live, from which the name Yahweh comes, denote both essential life and a state of being. Hence, God is not only eternal himself, but all his nature, characteristics, and attributes are as eternal and unchanging as is his life. Anything that is absolutely eternal is not only unending, but is also unchangeable. Anything that changes in any way is not eternal. For in the change, some characteristic is left behind and a new one acquired. In every change, something ends and something else begins. That which dwells in an eternal state knows no change. Change is possible only in that which is limited, imperfect, or undeveloped. Yahweh declares of himself, I am Yahweh, I change not. Malachi 3 verse 6 And the inspired apostle says of him, With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1 verse 17 God is never surprised. God has not learned anything this week, nor last year, nor in the last several trillion years. If God learned one thing today, it would destroy him. He would no longer be the omniscient one, who knows the end from the beginning, nor the omnipotent one, who has planned and ordained it all. For known unto God are all his works from the creation of the world. God does not experiment. God does not become stronger wiser, mightier, or increase himself in any way. He changes not. He eternally is all that he is without any decrease or increase or fluctuation whatsoever. Therefore, he is the eternal God, Yahweh. The origin and meaning of the name Yahweh are especially brought out in relation to Israel. When Moses at the burning bush says to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3, verses 13-14 through 14. The original of this name, I am that I am, is exactly the same as that of Yahweh, being existence, and denotes the one who always has been, is, and always will be, personal, continuous, absolute existence. I am that I am is Yahweh revealing what his name means, the unchangeable one. In this name, Yahweh is saying to the children of Israel, what I am, I always am. I never have been anything but what I am. I never will be anything other than what I am. What I was, I am. What I am, I shall be. I am what I am, unchangeably, irrevocably, and invariably. 
Tell the people of Israel that the eternal, self-existent, unchangeable one has sent you. Tell them that what I was to Abraham, I am. What I was to Isaac, I am. What I was to Jacob, I am. What I was to Joseph, I am. What I will be in the future, I already am. And throughout all your days, in every situation and circumstance, even unto the end of all times, when you shall seek my face and call upon me, you will find that I will be, even then, what I am. Hallelujah! Long centuries later, Yahweh spoke to the prophet Malachi these words, I am Yahweh, I change not. Of him who came into the world as the embodiment and visible representation of Yahweh, it is written, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus made a statement that the first Adam, in all of his glory, could never have made. He said, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. John 5, verses 25-26 through 26. Life in himself. This is self-existent life. A life not derived from any source, not dependent upon any sustenance. Inherent life. Thus Jesus could say, I am the life. No other man before him could say that. But the exceeding great wonder of all is that not only did Jesus possess the self-existent life of God, but God has made him to be a life-giving spirit. Truly, he that hath the Son hath life. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 1 John 5, verses 11 through 12. Notice the result of having the Holy Spirit. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the same life in you that was in Jesus when he walked on this earth as a man, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. How plain! If the Spirit of Yahweh dwells in us, He imparts the power to commence eternal self-existent life within us. From the incorruptible seed of Christ placed in the womb of the believing heart comes forth that incorruptible new creation which lives and abides forever. When John said, He that hath the Son hath life, he was speaking of that incorruptible life which Jesus is. When Jesus said, He that believeth on me shall never die, he was not teaching us merely of the possibilities of extending our physical Adamic existence for another thousand years so we would not go to the grave. He meant that he was planting an entirely new life within this womb of flesh, even the incorruptible self-existent life which he is. The life Jesus has made available is the life he is, the life of Yahweh, the abiding and unchangeable life of eternity. How many of the Lord's dear children understand not this one simple but sublime truth? They have within them the self-existent life of God. How many weak and weary saints are constantly running around from me?